Here we go. Here we go. All right, uh, my name is Tom Nelson uh, with the Commercial Vehicle Sex Minnesota State Patrol. Uh, I supervise the commercial guys, the troopers, and the civilians in the St. Cloud in the Brainerd area. Um, here today to talk, they wanted me to go over some uh, CDL stuff and also some of the new legs as far as uh, cell phones and texting and such. Um, email at the bottom and my phone number. For those of you in the back, you probably can't read it, but if anybody has any questions, um, my office phone number and my email address. I've already picked up two questions on the way in here. So, And I always like doing presentations in St. Cloud, number one, because it's close to my home. I live in Sartell. I don't have to travel and stay overnight. Uh, another reason I like coming here, you know, for years, they'd always have me like on day two in the morning, and, and I noticed that, uh, you know, St. Cloud, they must really have good water because every day on day two of a, a you know, conference like this, people are drinking water like a son of a bitch. So, <laughs> I'm guessing it's because the water is so good. <laughs> um, I was fortunate enough this past January, there was a group of us troopers that got to go out to the presidential inauguration detail. We worked security along the parade route. This is a picture of myself with Al Coots, who's the commander of the St. Cloud District here in St. Cloud. And, while we're out there, uh, we did have a little bit of free time to go see some of the monuments and stuff. Um, I wanted to see the Vietnam Wall. Uh, my, my uncle uh, was killed in Vietnam. I got to see his name, scratch it. That was a pretty, uh, pretty good deal for me. Got to see some of the other monuments. So it was really, it kind of brought up the patriotic juices for me. So uh, last month, um, President's Day, I had the day off and my daughter was getting ready for school. She was 14 years old. And, I was still feeling pretty patriotic, and I said, uh, Madison, I said, uh, you know, today's President's Day. I said, do you realize what President's Day is all about? And, you know, she said, yeah, I do, Dad. And I'm like, so I'm thinking, okay, she's going to tell me about Washington or Lincoln or something like that. And I said, okay, tell me, what is President Day? And what is it? And she looked at me and she said, well, that's when President Obama goes outside, and if he sees his shadow, we got four more years. <laughs> talk about John Boehner and get off their ass or whatever he was talking about. <laughs> anyway, just some basic definitions we'll go over. Uh, CDLs, uh, med cards, seat belts, and we'll cover a little bit about annual inspections. Uh, federal definition of a commercial vehicle is uh, anything that's used in interstate commerce where it crosses state lines over 10,000 pounds or it's a bus that transports hazmat, placardable amounts. Uh, the state definition is a little bit different. Uh, state definition of a commercial motor vehicle is uh, anything that's over 26,000 pounds, or it's a bus, or the use of the transport uh, hazmat. And if I could get you to swing that my direction so I don't have to keep turning around looking behind me. Um, Anything for you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Uh, as far as CDLs and uh, annual inspections and everything, what determines that what is needed is the gross vehicle weight of a, of a vehicle. And the gross vehicle weight, the definition of that is the gross uh, vehicle weight rating, which is on the door panel, or the actual weight of the vehicle, which is ever is greater. So i uh, use the example, you have a 71 Pinto, <coughs> but you're hauling an elephant in the back of it? <laughs> or maybe a girl from Foley? Um, <laughs> <laughs> the actual weight of that thing is, uh, is probably going to be higher than the gross people weight rating it. So I, I know, I know, guaranteed, I'm not going to get asked here back next year. <laughs> I apologize if I offended anybody. Okay, I, uh, it's a good thing I got small feet because I do put it in my mouth quite frequently. <laughs> and most of you probably know this, but honest to God, when I get phone calls when people ask about CDLs or annual inspections, they, when I ask them what the gross vehicle weight rating is, they'll, they'll tell me, well, I got it registered for 33,000 or 48. Registrated weight has nothing to do with uh, anything with the annual inspections or CDLs. We have to go with the gross vehicle weight rating or the actual weight, which is ever greater. Uh, the paperwork we typically look for, um, this is stuff that we look for on the roadside. 
the stuff that's in red is stuff that uh, political subdivisions are now required to have. So, and I'm, I'm assuming that's what most new people are. So basically you need the proof insurance, the daily vehicle inspection report from the previous day, and make sure you have that driver's license with you too. Um, do you need a CDL? Uh, people I get called at and ask this question too, um, they're asking about personal vehicles, personal use vehicles, do you need a CDL? Um, like a street truck or something, if somebody wants to go out on a date one night with a, a gravel truck, you know, do you need a CDL? And the answer is yes, it's, it's, it's not the intent of what the vehicle's being used for, it's what the actual gross vehicle weight rating is. That determines whether or not you need that CDL. So an individual that buys a street truck that's going to use it just to go up and down the road, go to his cabin, whatever, if that's over 26,000 pounds, they would need a CDL. Um, this is probably most of you is nothing new. Uh, the different classes of driver's license that we have, we have the type uh, D, which is just your basic um, driver's license. Then you also have the commercial licenses, the A's, the B's, and the C's. Uh, type C basically that would cover any vehicle in the D rated uh, vehicle, but they're hauling uh, hazardous <coughs> materials that are that's placardable. You would need to have that. Uh, Class C um, commercial driver's license. So you could take that same Pinto, and if you were hauling a placardable amount of hazmat, you would need a, a Type C driver's license. Uh, the Type B is good for anything that's uh, over 26,000 pounds, and with that, you can tow a trailer up to 10,000 pounds. Uh, basically, that's your street trucks, uh, gravel haulers, and whatnot. Class A basically is a combination of everything. You can, anything that's over 26 and you can haul a, a trailer that uh, exceeds 10,000 pounds. There are no uh, limitations on that. Um, this is just a curious example here. We have, uh, it's a truck that the gross vehicle weight rating is right at 26,000 pounds and the trailer is right at 10,000 pounds. A lot of people would assume that you would need a CDL to operate this vehicle. Uh, but actually for this combination, you're not over 26, the trailer's not over 10, so you need to buy with a Class D driver's license. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the endorsements. I'm sure those of you that need endorsements have them. Um, also, I get asked a lot of times about violations that people have. Is that going to affect their CDL? Um, it used to be that violations that occurred in a passenger car had no sanction whatsoever on a CDL. Uh, that has since changed, so violations that do happen in a passenger car can uh, have sanction effects on your CDL. That's what that bed rape says right there. It applies to offenses committed and revocations imposed on or before August 1st of 05 while operating a commercial vehicle and violations that occurred on or after August 1st of 2005 when operating a vehicle that is not a commercial vehicle. So just keep that in mind that uh, um, some violations now that occur in passenger cars can have sanctions on your CDL. I know uh, several organizations have a requirement, uh, a work requirement that in order to maintain your job you have to have a CDL and uh, there's been instances where people get popped for DWI or something like that can't hold a CDL or they lose their job. So just remember that there are violations that can sanction CDLs even if they don't happen in a commercial vehicle. Uh, for a first conviction, uh, for a refusal or a DWI in a commercial vehicle or non-commercial vehicle, uh, you're gonna lose your CDL. If you can see it in the blue, you're disqualified for one year. That's in a commercial vehicle or a non-commercial vehicle. Uh, leaving the scene of an accident, um, whether or not it's in a CMV, you're going to uh, lose your uh, CDL privileges for a year. Um, for the first conviction refusal while operating a CMV transporting a hazmat, you're going to lose it for three years. And I have never, I have never seen, I've been in with the commercial vehicle section since 04. I have not heard of that or seen that in the state of Minnesota, but I imagine it probably could happen. Uh, for the second conviction or refusal, 
um, of any of the following types of violations in a CMB or non-CMB, a person is going to be disqualified for life. Now, if you use a vehicle in commission of a felony involving manufacturing, distributing, uh, dispensing controlled substances, you will lose it for life. And also they talk about serious traffic <coughs> violations. There will be sanctions on the CDL for tra uh, serious traffic violations, whether or not you're driving a CMV. And uh, for the second uh, conviction, within three years of this table we're gonna go through, you lose it for 60 days. For uh, third <coughs> or subsequent, in three years, you're gonna lose it for 120 days. And what they deem to be a serious traffic offense in a CMV or non-CMV is uh, any speed, um, that exceeds uh, more than 15 miles an hour over the posted speed limit. Uh, basically reckless driving, making improper erratic lane changes, following too close to the vehicle in front of you, or if you violate any state or local law, um, traffic law other than parking violations that arise out of a fatal crash, then your CDL would be sanctioned or driving a CMV without a CDL. Um, driving a CMV without a CDL in a back possession, that is a violation, but it's kind of like driving a passenger car without your DL in possession. You prove that you have one, and then that one will just go away. Uh, also, driving a CMV without the proper class of CDL, that would lead to sanctions. Or violating any uh, state statute regarding texting. You lose uh, typically a, a, a normal uh, passenger carrier or a CDL, doesn't matter. Um, four moving violations in 12 months, you're going to lose your driver's license. Or if you have five moving violations in 24 months, your driver's license is going to be sanctioned. This is just for any traffic offense. Um, another issue that comes up quite frequently, I'm sure if I asked you here, I'd probably get a 50 50 um, either way. The question always comes up, if a CDL holder, you know, what is the legal threshold for alcohol content? Is it 0.04 because they have a CDL or is it 0.08 like, you know, the normal general public? The answer is, it depends on the type of vehicle you're using. So if it's a passenger car, even though you have a CDL, that alcohol threshold is 0.08. If you're in a commercial vehicle, then that threshold is 0 0.04. I get asked that quite a bit. Also keep in mind though that when you're in a uh, CMV that requires, uh, well even if it doesn't require CDL, anything over 10,000 pounds, there is a zero tolerance. You can't have any alcohol in your system whatsoever. The only alcohol that's, and you can't have any alcohol on board either. Like, so you, Every once in a while when I'm driving through Sartell, I'll stop or I'll drive past uh, Riverboat Depot and a lot of times I'll see, you know, like local landscapers that are there for lunch or whatever. They got their half-ton pickups pulling their trailers and their lawnmowers. I'm hoping they're just having lunch because that combination is going to be over 10,000 pounds. You know, one beer, that, that's a disqualifier. So the only alcohol that can be on board also is if it's part of the manifest of load. So, and when I first got this commercial vehicle gig, I didn't know all the answers, so I stopped to do an inspection on a Budweiser truck and I saw all this beer and I thought, wow. I bought a lot of all it, but somebody pointed out that as part of manifest of load, it doesn't count. So. Uh, drug and alcohol testing, I'm sure you're familiar with this, that any holder of a CDL has to be uh, involved in drug and alcohol program. Uh, med cards. We'll go over that. I know most of you here are probably exempt from holding a med card because you work for a local uh, government entity. But for a he uh, health card, uh, this is what one looks like. Um, basically, most of the time, for those of you that have to have one, it's a two-year card. Um, you can get it restricted to a one-year card if you have issues with high blood pressure, diabetes, or something. Your doctor could give you one med card or a one-year med card. So um, what I always tell people, you know, a lot of times these doctors, when they fill these paper, this paperwork out, they're not too familiar with it a lot of times. So when they do fill out a med card for you, that for those of you that require one, make sure that they fill it out all accurately and that the, the exam date is accurate and the, uh, 
expiration date is uh, accurate. Because if you're entitled for a two-year card, I've, I've seen it before where the exam date and the expiration date is listed as the same. And I always tell people that, you know, when you go get the DOT physical, you know the last thing that doctor does to you? Right? <laughs> At least he can do is fill out that paperwork. <laughs> Actually, uh, my last physical, when uh, that time came, the doctor told me, he said, Tommy said, I realize this is probably not, you know, your, the highlight of your day, but he said, I'll tell you what, it's not the highlight of mine either. <laughs> but, so like I said, if, you, if you're good for a two-year card, make sure you get one and they don't make a mistake and just give you one or the expiration date is the same as the exam date. Um, I, I was doing an inspection at the Dayton Port Scale a couple years ago on Highway 10 just outside Elk River. And the guy ended up, he had a one-year card, and he looked healthy as a horse. And I asked him, I said, is there a reason that your card is only one-year card? And he said, no, it shouldn't be. I said, any high blood pressure, diabetes, or anything? He said, no. And I said, well, I have the phone number for the doctor's office. So I said, let me call. I'll, you know, you go sit in your vehicle. I'll check for you. And if everything's kosher, don't worry about it. So I'm on the phone, and then I'm typing my inspection. The guy comes back, and he says, uh, Mr. Nelson, uh, I do take Viagra. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's cool, but uh, that's not as qualified. That's the information. So, if you're required to have a card, like I said, make sure that everything is filled out properly. <laughs> this guy here, I, I put this picture in here. This guy was stopped for an inspection, was required to wear corrective lenses, but he did not have them with him, which it's a disqualifier on a CDL. But this guy happened to be a scuba diver that had prescription scuba gear. <laughs> had, had his goggles with him. So by putting those things on, he was legal to drive. And that's another thing I should probably highlight too. A lot of people that have med cards, they'll go in and they'll get LASIK surgery. So that their eyesight is, is virtually perfect. But if your med card or your driver's license still shows that you're required to have lenses, that overrides any note that your doctor gives you or whatever. Get the med card and get the driver's license changed. Okay? We, that's what I have to go by. Not with you know a doctor's slip. I have to go by what's on the med card or the driver's license. Um, is anybody here, are you guys all familiar with that uh, self-certification for health cards? Be Yes, no? Okay. Um, basically, what they're trying to do now is the United States, they're trying to um, make the regulations mirror what they do in Canada and Mexico, whereas basically you don't have to have that separate piece of paper for the med card with you. It's just that if you have a CDL, you've already proven to your government that you do have a health card. Mexico and Canada already do that. The U.S. is trying to go to that. And uh, any new CDL holder is going to have to self-certify or when somebody goes to renew their CDL. Uh, people can self-certify. They started it here in January of 12. Uh, mm -hmm. August of 13, those that have not self-certified, that basically they're, you know, what, what they're self-certifying is that you're exempt from needing a med card. So those, they're going to send out warning letters August of, of 13, um, and everybody has to be self-certified by... January 1st of 2014. Otherwise, what happens is their CDL will get dropped down to a Class D driver's license. Um, so, is there anybody here that's heard of this? No. no, no. no. Oh, you heard? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And this is the form here. This is the form that's uh, Department of Public Safety Vehicle Driver Services. And so, what you guys would do that work for government entities when you fill out this paperwork, Category 4 here states that you're interstate, but you're exempt from the uh, medical examination requirements in Minnesota. You fill out this form and, and send that in, and that will, that's the self-certification process that we're talking about. And this is, uh, if you just want more information on it, you just Google the uh, Driver and Vehicle Services website. That'll tell you more about it. We're not hearing so much about it now. I, I'm getting a few people coming to my office asking me about what's all this about, but I assume that the closer we get to uh, August of 2013 here, when all these warning letters are going to go out, I'm assuming that I'm going to get a whole bunch of people calling me with questions. But that's what it is. You're self-certifying that you hold the CDL, but you're not required to have the med card because you work for a local government entity or whatever. So go ahead. 
what if you're required to have one? Then does it? You don't need. If to you're required, it? then yeah. well then yeah, that's you don't have to do that. Okay. All right. No, I do not. If you go to uh, the uh, like I said, just Google God will give you services. So I just wanted to have, you know every time uh, as I talk to groups, uh, local government entities, I, I might want to hit that because it's going to be something that's going to come up here this summer. Like I said, you guys would be category whoop, category number four. So, and, and I stand correct that the guy that asked if you're required to have a med card, yeah, you'll have to fill this out too. You'll just check a different box. Okay. I stand correct that you'll have to submit a copy of that. Go ahead. Yeah, I received the letter and I was totally confused about what needed to happen, so I just faxed in a copy of my new medical card. Yep, yep, and that's exactly under number one there. It tells you what to do. So. Like I said, it's, it's, uh, if, if the word's not out right now, um, it's going to be coming out when the, all these warning letters go out. So just a heads up. Uh, texting, just know that state statute prohibits texting. Rather, it, it doesn't uh, matter if you're in a passenger car or a commercial vehicle. The state statute, texting, it applies to everybody. Okay? Um, also, uh, cell phone use. Uh, they just passed a Fed reg with cell phone. It was, I think, last year. And some of the reasons they did this is that, according to uh, NHTSA, cell phones are the number one cause of distracted driving crashes that they have nationwide. Research done by NHTSA has revealed that approximately 28% of traffic accidents involve cell phones. This is probably something that most of you are probably aware of. Also, NHTSA states that drivers who use cell phones are four times more likely to be involved in a crash resulting in injuries than if they had not been on the phone. A driver on a phone exhibits lower reaction time and greater impairment than a driver who has a BAC of uh, point, greater than 0.08. So that's part of the reason for the cell phone ban. Um, this took effect um, January 3rd of 2012. You cannot use handheld cell phones in a commercial vehicle. Um, you can, the only time you can dial is if you have something like speed dial where you only punch one number, nothing more. So my question to my boss was like, well, if I see an emergency, I can only dial nine. I can't dial nine. <laughs> <laughs> he said, no. Well, and they showed me later on, it was there's an exemption for emergencies. So I was just being a smart ass. <laughs> <laughs> also, what I see a lot, which you can use now, is Bluetooth, you know, where you uh, use a Bluetooth and you communicate that way. Um, I see a lot of that for if people use speaker phones, they'll just do the one touch dialing and set it down and use a speaker phone. Now, with that being said about the cell phones and everything, keep in mind that the federal regulation, where they put that in federal regulations, is in a section that exempts local government entities. Is anybody familiar with that? Yes, no, maybe? That where they put it, uh, when it when it first passed, it's in a section that exempts uh, local government entities from that. So I, I was getting calls from a lot of, uh, of local smaller cities, counties, and stuff. And even though you know it's in a section that exempts them, a lot of these uh, um, local entities are coming up with uh, policies that ban it because it, it just basically it's not. It's not a good practice when you drive a commercial motor vehicle. But, um, I know my brother, he works, or my brother in law works for a garden taller in Malacca. And what they have to do is when they uh, show up for work, they have to hand in their personal cell phones. And then he gives them a work one that they can only use for work related uh, items because this guy wants to make sure that nothing happens um, to his drivers with uh, any cell phone use. So, where they put it in Fed regs, it does exempt local government entities, but like I said, a lot of them are, are coming up with policies to prevent it, just to cover their butts. Uh, carrier identification, um, that's something that just changed uh, recently, is uh, the carrier name and the DOT number has to be on both sides of a vehicle. It used to be that it had to be over 26,000 pounds in order for that to apply to Minnesota, but that's now any commercial vehicle, so any single unit or combination <coughs> over 10,000 has to have the name and DOT number on the side. Uh, that is not required though on government vehicles. You don't have to have the name and the DOT number. Um, just some information on tax exempt plates that if you do run with tax exempt plates, 
You have to have the name of the department or the subdivision um, listed uh, on both sides of the vehicle. That's kind of the exemption from uh, having the DOT number listed. Uh, I was asked uh, to talk about the pre-trip inspections. Um, you know, and this involves, you know, pre-trip, post-trip, I get asked this quite a bit. What you have to do at the end of your day, you have to do a post-trip inspection to make sure, you know, that there's no violations on there. And then if there are, you know it on your post-trip. And then as far as a pre-trip goes, what has to happen to satisfy the pre-trip is that whoever's driving that thing the next day, they have to look at yesterday's post-trip, make sure that any defects that were listed are corrected, and then they do their own walk around to make sure that the vehicle's in, in good operating condition. The only time that you have to sign your pre-trip is if that there were defects noted and they were corrected. If you don't find any defects, you know, if there were no defects on yesterday's post crash, you don't have to have a reviewing signature for your pre-trip. A lot of confusion on that. A lot of times I'll get people, they'll do a pre-trip and they'll sign it, and then they'll do a post-trip and sign it again. That's fine. If you're not, that, that's fine. You're just being extra cautious, I guess. But technically, like I said, the only signature you would need would be for the post-trip. But if an individual wants to sign it after the pre-trip and the post-trip, that's perfectly fine. I just, I get asked that quite frequently. I got asked that today, actually. Like I said, you have to sign it if the defects were corrected. This guy here evidently found some defects, so he's, he's working on it. He wants to get it going down the road. Okay, like we said, the post-trip at the end of each day for each vehicle driven. I get asked this quite a bit, too. Sometimes there may be three individuals who drive a vehicle on one, you know, one given day. You know, are they all required to do the... Um, post-trip, you follow the pre-trip procedures, the answer is yes. It's not just one every 24 hours, it's each driver. And then the period is uh, supposed to maintain these for three months or 90 days. And I got a call the other day, somebody asked me, uh, do I have to turn them in each day or can I keep a whole, you know, do I have to turn them in each month or can I keep them all in and until my book runs out or my truck? Whatever, just know that the carrier has to maintain them for 90 days. And uh, I'm sure you guys that drive commercial vehicles, you know what the reports have, you know, on your inspection report, you can have whatever you want listed on there, but at minimum you have to have the brakes, uh, parking brake, service brake, steering, lights and reflectors, coupling devices, horn, windshield wipers, and um, washer fluid. Make sure that you check the washer fluid. I, I come across quite a bit of them that uh, the, the windshield wipers work with the washer fluid to dry. You know, it's just, you know, if you ought to keep it full, it's just you got to shot to try to get you wet, you know, and activate that stuff. Same thing with the horn. If the horn working, then we blow my eardrums out. That's, you guys are way to get back at me. Uh, rear view mirrors, uh, tires, wheels and rims, uh, the emergency equipment. I see a lot of times people don't check the emergency equipment. You gotta have the three triangles, the fire extinguisher that is secured, not just laying on the floor. It's gotta be secured and it's gotta be fully charged. And also make sure you have spare fuses. So if you happen to pop a fuse, that you can replace it. A lot of times when I do my inspection, there is a violation for fail to check the emergency equipment. So when I'm doing an inspection, I'll ask them, do you have triangles? And they'll like, yeah, I got them around here somewhere. Well, that tells me he didn't do a pre-trip or a post-trip, so that's one violation, and fail to check emergency equipment, that's another one. And with this new CSA um, going around with uh, <coughs> how they you know, judge differently the, uh, the at-risk carriers, I mean, every violation like that makes a difference. So you wanna avoid the ones that are really simple to avoid. And this is just a generic copy of uh, the daily vehicle inspection report that you can buy, but like I said, I. You can have anything listed on those that you want, but you just have to make sure you have it at minimum the stuff that we just went over. Um, a lot of carriers, I know, they'll just make it up their own and they'll just photocopy it and have a whole bunch of copies of that. That's fine. There is no pres uh, prescribed form. Just make sure that it, it uh, includes at least the minimum of uh, what we covered. And then, uh, as far as the annual inspection, I oversee the mandatory inspection <laughs> program in Minnesota. It's part of my gig. Anybody here an annual inspector? Okay. 
you don't look familiar, so must not have sanctioned you. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's funny too because uh, I mean, I'll get guys that when they do the annuals, um, my guys will do inspections like two days later, and the guy will ball tires. And so I call the inspector up, and he said, "Well, yeah, that guy told me he had new tires at the shop, so I just passed it, and he was going to change them when he got home. When he did, you know. So then that guy's, you know, hanging out there. Actually, I uh, about three years ago, I found an individual who was manufacturing the annual inspection decals and then selling them to these people. He was doing bogus inspections. We've done like 1,800 of them, and the reason we found him is because uh, one of the vehicles he had done was involved in a fatal crash. So, and that's how, that's what got me onto him, but uh, um, ended up uh, charging him with a whole bunch of different violations, and his court deal um, went on for two years, and in the meantime, they, they made it a gross misdemeanor to do a fraudulent inspection. And what ended up happening is ultimately after two years, he pled guilty to the law that was established after he got caught. So that's what happened to him. So uh, any required on any single unit or combination over 26,000 pounds. So basically, if you have a CMV towing a trailer and the combo is over 26,000 pounds, both those units have to have the annual inspection. Give you some uh, a phone number here and our website. If you have any questions, I field these quite frequently. Uh, my office is located at the DOT building in St. Cloud. So you can either get a hold of us on the web or our info line. Otherwise, uh, most of you, I'm assuming, are fairly close to St. Cloud here. My office number, 320-223-6674. So if you have any questions on anything, covered today or, or, or any other questions, uh, feel free to uh, give me a call. And it's my understanding that this is, the, I was the last presenter for your group, is that right? So next, I, I don't know what time it is, but if I'm cutting it a little soon, I don't think you'll mind, because I understand there's a drying neck. And I, I heard that I was like, I was like leading the category of the best presenter, is that right? Yeah. <laughs>